Hello, I'm Samir Dhurde and uh, I'm very happy to welcome you to the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, which we uh, popularly call as IUCA, right? So uh, it is a, always a pleasure to have so many of you students gathered here, curious about science, and also to have the teachers who are enabling uh, this uh, you know event which has been happening for many many years now in this series we basically <coughs> uh, wish to introduce you and put you in touch with uh, active scientists who are working in some field of research across the world and uh, get them and you to talk in very simple words in in very uh, level at the level that you are learning in school and to understand what is the kind of uh, special work they are doing this is also a way in which you can actually see how a scientist's mind works, you know, how they, uh, how they think, how they uh, you know, think ahead. So such uh, lovely tips can also be had from uh, such interactions. So it is our pleasure today to have uh, with us uh, Dr. Varun Bhalerao, who is from IIT Bombay currently. And he has especially uh, brought to us a very interesting topic called studying the universe from space. <clears throat> So uh, Dr. Bhalero is of course a very old acquaintance of us and uh, in fact I would, I'm happy to say that he was a, a school student in Pune, so he's a Puneite by uh, origin. Uh, he was in Kalmadi High School. If anybody from Kalmadi High School here? If not, come today, no worries. So <clears throat> he's from uh, Kalmadi High School and he uh, did his schooling here, his college here and uh, also, uh, at that time, he was also a very active amateur astronomer. So, uh, along with his schooling, etc., he was also interested in the sky. He was looking up and uh, doing various activities. He was also part of the uh, Astrophysics Astronomy Olympiad program, right, where he uh, got uh, several accolades. Then he went on to uh, do his uh, BTEC in IIT Bombay. Went on to do his PhD at one of the most prestigious uh, engineering uh, institutes, Caltech, California Institute of Technology. And then uh, he has returned back to India. Uh, as uh, He came back to Ayuka actually as a, as a postdoctoral fellow and is now a, a professor in the IIT Bombay. Okay? So he's got a, a great group there and uh, also a lo lot of collaborations across the country in which he has, he's working on uh, particularly uh, telescopes, which are of various kinds, including some which work in space, his first uh, project, I think. And then also another telescope, which is shown in this picture, which he will describe. So I'll not take away the suspense from that. <clears throat> uh, well, he, uh, just to tell you a little bit more, he's a recipient of the Vainu Bappu gold medal, which is the highest honor given by the Astronomical Society of India. And uh, he's also, uh, you know, he's also got the IIT Bombay Early Researcher Award, uh, Research Achiever Award, and the Kirti Ram, uh, Ramam Ritham Award for Creative Engineering. Okay, so this is a uh, this is a list of several accolades that he has got, and today he has specially for us, for you know, uh, students from uh, of your age, he has got this special talk about studying the universe from space. So let's welcome him on stage, Dr. Varun Bhalera. Okay. <coughs> Hi all, good morning. So, can someone tell me what are you seeing here? What is this? That's correct. That's the Milky Way. All of them are stars in our own galaxy. And what you are seeing here, this little thing at the back, this is the Growth India Telescope. Okay, it's located in Ladakh, in Hanle. And it is a fully robotic telescope. Okay, what does that mean? Now, usually when you think of a telescope, you think that someone is sitting at that telescope and then they are actually looking through the eyepiece and looking at stars and observing and so on. Well, it does not actually work that way because just seeing something, I won't be able to exactly recall it later. For example, you have seen me right now. If I go and hide and tell all of you to draw my face, you will not get it right. Okay, but when I'm doing research, that is not acceptable. I want to make sure that I can note exactly whatever is being seen. So all telescopes have very high quality instruments that are used for them. There are cameras, there are spectrographs and Growth India Telescope like any other telescope also has those. So what does an observer do? The astronomer who's at the telescope simply sits there and types commands. Okay, but it turns out I like astronomy 
but I also like to sleep at night, right? How many of you like to sleep? Oh, there are some of you who don't like to sleep. Maybe you are already asleep, that's okay. So, um, if you like to sleep at night and you want to be an astronomer, then what do you do? Okay, so we took all the engineering students at IIT Bombay, we worked very hard and fully automated the operation of this telescope. So, every afternoon at around 4 o'clock, there is a list made of targets that we want to observe tonight. That list goes from Mumbai to Bangalore. Hanley, this site is so remote that we don't even have internet there. So, we have a special satellite link from ISRO. So, from Mumbai, the command goes to Bangalore. From Bangalore, it goes to ISRO satellite. From the satellite, it goes to Hanley. And we just inform the telescope that here is a list of targets that you have to observe tonight. And then we sleep. Okay, the computer at the telescope decides what are the targets to be observed in what order, when is something rising, when is something setting, and it does all of that by itself. And then at the end of it all, in the morning, all of that data gets transferred back to us. Okay, and okay, we need all mobiles off, please. So I'm going to pause here for a moment. Everyone who has a mobile, pull it out. Everybody. Who all are carrying mobiles? Okay, now look at your neighbor's mobile and make sure it's silent. Okay, we'll have only one soundtrack going on at a time. All right, so that's enough about the Hanley telescope. This is not what I want to talk about today, right? What I want to talk about today is studying space from space, right? So let's get started with that. There are two major global events that are happening this week. Okay, the first is that this is the World Space Week. Okay. The second event, so World Space Week means that everyone around the world is celebrating the achievements that all of humankind has made in respect to exploring space. The second thing that is happening is also a program by the International Astronomical Union called 100 Hours of Astronomy, under which for 100 continuous hours there are programs being done by various institutes around India and around the world to connect people with astronomy, to connect people with the stars again. We are just coming out of monsoon, so we are beginning to see the stars at least slightly. But the sky that you see in Pune is nothing like the sky you saw in the first video, right? So we are living in a world where light pollution is increasingly common and we can't even appreciate the beauty of the heavens. So events like this are extremely important. Now in the middle of all of this, I had a big problem. Because now there are two events going on, one is celebrating space science and one is celebrating astrophysics. So which one should I actually talk about? Okay, so what we'll do is let's do a show of hands or actually let's do something better since again Saturday morning everyone is sleepy. So let's shout. Okay, how many of you like astrophysics? Say yes. How many like astrophysics? Yes. Very few. Okay. How many like space science? Yes. Okay, now that space science people have shouted already, let's ask astrophysics people again. How many of you like astrophysics? Yes. Oh, okay. So what I'm going to do is, I'll give a fair shot to both, and I'll talk about astrophysics and space science together. Now, how many of you know actually that these two are different? Okay, so let me explain what the difference is, right? This is space science. Space science is about going into space. Space science is about exploring space, launching rockets, satellites, putting people on the moon, on planets, astronauts, and all of that. This is what space science is about, okay? On the other hand, what is astronomy and astrophysics? That is about the sun, moon, and so on, but it is also about far away galaxies and stars and how the universe was created, how the sun was born, how was the earth formed, okay? All of that, learning about the entire universe is what astrophysics is about. And we usually think of both those things as the same. For example, if I ask you about astronomy and astrophysics, you will of course talk about a place like Ayuka, but you will also talk about ISRO, where ISRO does have a small group that does astrophysics, but what ISRO is mainly responsible for doing is space science. They are responsible for putting people and satellites and things into space. What places like Ayuka are responsible for doing is studying stars, planets, galaxies, and where the world came from, okay? Now, astrophysics itself is an amazing, amazing field. The universe is filled with objects that you can't even imagine, and there is no way you could actually create them on Earth. For example, yes, both answers are correct. This is a scene from the movie Interstellar, 
and what you see here right now is not a black hole but what you see there coming into view soon is a black hole okay and this black hole is something called as a super massive black hole it is something that is a million or a billion times heavier than the sun okay just think about it the sun is about a million times heavier than earth and what we are what we saw in that clip is a black hole that is a million or a billion times heavier than the entire sun okay these exist at the centers of galaxies at the center of our galaxy also there is some a supermassive black hole but as far as global or universal standards go it's a very wimpy supermassive black hole it's only 4 million solar masses only okay in a world where everyone else is a billionaire millionaires ko koi bhav nahi deta now these supermassive black holes by the uh, this rendering was quite interesting it was from a award winning movie called interstellar okay but what is fun is that all of these renderings that you see about how things will move around a black hole these were actually done by a physicist by an astrophysicist who later won the nobel prize not for the movie okay now how many of you have seen any bollywood movie anything anyone right you have seen that bollywood directors love to ignore physics right someone gives a kick 10 people fly off boom how many of you have tried doing that in school hopefully none your teachers are around even if you have don't raise your hand so bollywood absolutely disrespect physics here christopher nolan when he wanted to make interstellar actually went and contracted kip thorne who is a nobel laureate who works on gravitational waves and other things and said we want to know what things will be like around black holes and they bought a supercomputer from the budget of the movie made the renderings and kip thorne also put a condition saying that i will give you the output and you either use it or don't use it you are not allowed to modify it later right so if physics tells you that a kick can't make 10 people fly then you have to respect that and the director agreed and this was the end result okay so this is what a black hole really would look like if you go there that said finally christopher nolan also decided to ignore physics libraries have nothing to do with time travel they have nothing there are no libraries inside black holes okay so okay what else do we have that's interesting in space these are extrasolar planets this is our solar system for scale this is mercury venus earth mars jupiter this is where those orbits would be and you can see our planet slowly earth is moving around in this sped up time lapse but at the same pace see how fast the other planets are moving by now we know several thousand planets around other stars and those are also planets that we know only in a local neighborhood of our galaxy okay so in the universe itself there are billions and billions of planets and we don't even know how many of them might have advanced life on them right we have no idea if aliens exist just yet and studying all of this is also within the realm of astronomy now within astronomy and astrophysics my favorite is this object called neutron stars okay so sorry someone said something i would like to hear that okay now you are shy um okay neutron star is something that is about the mass of the sun could be as much as 3 times the mass of the sun but the diameter of the sun is very large okay radius of the sun is some 700000 kilometers for comparison neutron stars are about the size of pune okay so this is if you search for pune on google maps then this is what you get as the boundary and the neutron star is just larger than that what it means is that if you scoop up a mug full of neutron star matter it weighs as much as mount everest okay that is how dense it is and th things like this are what you can't even imagine okay the atom you will have studied atoms in school right and there's a nucleus which has protons and neutrons and there are electrons that are going around and so on the density of a neutron star is a factor of few higher than the density of the nucleus of an atom okay the magnetic fields of a neutron star are the strongest magnetic field that ever exist in the universe temperatures can get extremely hot gravity is the highest gravity if you outside of a black hole so the universe has these absolutely crazy objects that we would like to study about because that is what will tell us how the world works that is how it will tell us more and more things about how the world is made up and that in turn leads us to build 
basic simple devices which we then use in our day to day life. A fantastic example of this is GPS. Okay, how many of you have ever booked a taxi or seen your parents book a taxi using a phone or ordered pizza at home or ordered home delivery of food? Right? We all think of map me pin dalna, right? The pin tithe ali ki zalo. You you know that the food is going to reach your home. A hundred and twenty years ago, Albert Einstein was sitting and thinking, how does gravity work? Okay, and what if we start running really fast? Apart from getting tired, what will happen to us? And in that scenario, he started exploring and developed first the theory of special relativity and the theory of general relativity. And those theories are critical for GPS to work. Okay, so every time you have ordered food at home, you should thank Einstein, who was thinking about the nature of space time and came up with theories of black holes. Now, when Einstein was doing that, clearly he was not thinking about. Oh, maybe my great 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 grandson will want to order pizza at home. Let me figure out gravity for that, right? No. All of these applications come later. What you begin with is a quest to understand the world that we live in. And that is why we study astrophysics, right? So, why do we want to study astrophysics at all? The reason why we want to study astrophysics is to actually solve the biggest mysteries in the world. And actually, even the world is not correct. We want to solve the biggest mysteries in the entire universe, including the birth of the universe and the eventual fate of the universe itself. And that is really what we are after. So, how do we study this? We mainly study this with the help of light. So, I'm sure you are all familiar with rainbows. Has everyone seen a rainbow? Yes. If not, you are seeing it here. So, now you have. Okay, so you, when you have light, you pass it through a prism, it splits into the seven familiar colors that we talk about. But that is not the only form of light, what we technically call electromagnetic radiation. There are many other types of light as well. Okay, for example, a very common form of light that we all use these days is Wi Fi. Okay, Wi Fi is made of radio waves. And radio waves are electromagnetic radiation of a very similar sort as the normal visible light that you and I are seeing. Microwave ovens, they actually heat things up using radio waves at actually similar frequencies as Wi Fi. Okay, so hmm. your dish TV, that is radio waves that are being downlinked from satellites. You may have actually seen some images like this during the COVID pandemic, right? This is a thermal camera and this is telling you that faces of people are hot and it can actually be used to measure temperatures and so on. This is infrared radiation, again light. Or if you go to a doctor and you get an x-ray taken, that is again light. Okay, so all of these are different forms of electromagnetic radiation. And just as when you go to a doctor, the doctor first looks at your face and decides or if you want to bunk school, you get up in the morning and tell your parents, oh, my stomach is aching, right? Parents see your face already and tell that you are lying. But instead of that, if you have to go to a doctor, they can use techniques like this or this. Each type of light tells us something different about the objects in front of us. And the same holds true with astronomy and astrophysics as well, where the objects that we want to study are so far away that we can't actually go there and touch them and measure them and so on. We have to do it from here. And for that, we have to use different types of light to do it. But all of these studies cannot be done from the ground. Okay, so what is plotted here, at the bottom there are all of these different types of light. So we have something called wavelength of light or frequency, which is how many times it oscillates per second. If it oscillates very fast, you get X-rays and gamma rays. Then you have optical light here and then at this side, when the oscillations are very slow, you have radio waves. And radio and optical light can actually make it through the atmosphere into the ground. Everything else cannot. So if I want to study something in X-rays, I actually have to go outside the Earth's atmosphere. The atmosphere just absorbs all X-rays. Okay, now in school, if you have ever heard about X-rays, then you will have heard about them as radiation that goes through everything. How can radiation that goes through everything actually be blocked by the atmosphere? Well, the atmosphere is huge. Right? Over a small distance inside a lab, the X-rays will actually go through it. But when you have 
the entire atmosphere around the earth which is hundreds of kilometers tall then that completely blocks all of that light so in order to do that we actually need to go to space and india has been doing this for a long long time okay uh, right back in 90s this is before most of you were even born one of the first indian satellites which was launched irs stands for indian research satellite irs p3 which is here's the photo and on it it had a payload or a instrument called ixae indian x-ray astronomy experiment okay and with ixae they looked at objects in x-rays different sources in x-rays and they saw how the brightness was changing over time okay so let's look at this in two different bands of x-rays so think of it as if these were red x-rays and blue x-rays of course that's not the actual color that they have they are much much different type of light but they are still light and they observed something like this where the brightness of this object where the brightness of this object first goes up okay and it goes up quite uh, slowly as such and then beyond that it drops very suddenly okay now uh, how many of you have ever helped your parents in the kitchen many of you good 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 that's an improvement nice so if you have ever heated something right you boil water it takes maybe a couple of minutes to boil water but it takes half an hour for it to come back to room temperature right warm water it will it will not be boiling hot but it will remain warm for a long time so usually any time it is easy to heat things fast but it is not easy to cool them very fast so this is very weird behavior okay so if you don't want to touch hot water what you do is you wear gloves right or you use a pair of tongs so similarly the only way to get rid of that thing which is it is getting bright because it is heating up but then to suddenly make it disappear you actually have to uh, the only way to do that is you have to hide it behind a curtain okay just as my remote has gone magic hidden behind a curtain okay and you can see that this kept happening again and again and again so let me use a virtual laser here you can see that the brightness is going up and then falls back very suddenly okay the only way to do that the only curtain that we know of in the entire universe is black holes so what you are seeing here is oops thanks oh, what you are seeing here is that there is stuff that is going close to a black hole and then falling in okay so let me show you an animation so there is a giant star and there's a black hole next to that star the gravity of that black hole is so strong that it is sucking out matter from that star and it is going in spinning around in a disk and falling into that black hole and as that happens every now and then a bunch of matter piles up and suddenly as it is piling up it gets hot 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 then suddenly it falls into that black hole and boom it's all gone okay so just as the screen is now dark for that matter the chapter is closed it's fallen into the black hole you are never going to see it again and this was a discovery that was made and proven it was verified with the very first set of indian space telescopes the team which did this was a team of people um, including some names that you might have heard dr kasturi rangan dr sita uh, p c agarwal and so on and all of these people then got together and said great we have actually started doing scientific research from space this is something that matters in the long term for the country what's next and what's next was they decided to say that okay now apart from building a small experiment which is just a proof of concept to show or to see if we can do it let's actually go ahead and build the world's best space telescope okay and they built this thing called astrosat okay so astrosat was launched just about 9 years ago this is a fully indian space telescope and astrosat has five different telescopes on it okay so at the center you have the ultraviolet imaging telescope then you have the soft x-ray imaging telescope you have a scanning sky monitor these boxes here are uh, the large area x-ray proportional counter this is the world's largest x-ray telescope that has ever been launched okay this when i say ever it means telescopes launched by nasa by esa by uh, jaxa which is the japanese agency anyone anyone the best x-ray timing instrument that has ever been made in the world is made in india okay 
and then we have the cadmium zinc telluride imager. Uh, I was actually in Ayuka when this was being built and this part Ayuka has a strong contribution and this was now built and launched about uh, nine years ago. You can see more details on this site and outside we have a nice model of AstroSat which you can go and uh, check it out later. Okay. Um, AstroSat, the, the main unique thing that AstroSat does is multi-wavelength observations. So it observes the sky in different types of light. So here's an example again of what you can see in different types of light. Okay, this person wearing a cap is actually me. Okay, you can barely see it. And I am taking a picture with two different cameras here. On the right is what you would usually see. This is optical light. On the left is the same thing with a heat vision camera. And you can see some interesting differences. For example, here it is not obvious whether this topi is sitting on the head of a person or just a statue. And you can see that where this guy's head is actually touching the hat, it is warmer. And the rest of the hat is cooler. Okay, red means hotter. Right? You can see that my hands are warmer than the camera. Okay, camera was cold. Here's very something very interesting. This woman's glasses are actually opaque in infrared. That's why they appear cool. Okay, her face is emitting heat and that is appearing as red. But her glasses, her chashma is blocking that heat and you can see them as cold colors here. You could not have told the temperature or the properties of the glasses just from this photo, but here they suddenly become obvious. So that's why AstroSat has all of these different telescopes that are sitting on a single platform. And they are the most sensitive telescopes in the world. So on this plot, this is how sensitive a telescope is. And you can see that these, this is a NASA experiment which was launched before AstroSat. And you can see how much higher AstroSat is on that axis. Okay, it can observe in many types of light, ultraviolet light, optical light, X-rays of many, many different energies. It can also study how things change. And it can study them at timescales of microseconds. Okay, extremely fast. This is, if you have tried to play with a stopwatch on your phone or on your uh, watch, okay, you will see that it is even hard to control the watch to milliseconds. Okay, which is the smallest that you see. Typically, 10 milliseconds is the smallest that you see on these stopwatches. This can do it 10,000 times faster. And then it can study extremely slow variability over days, weeks, months, or even years. And then it actually continuously keeps an eye on the sky, saying we want to see if anything is changing there. And lastly, putting it all together, it is actually the world's best multi-wavelength observatory, okay? So every time you think of space, it's common that the word NASA comes to your head when you're thinking of astrophysics, you'll think of things like James Webb Space Telescope or Hubble Space Telescope and so on. Remember that the best multi-wavelength observatory ever made is made in India by ISRO and by Indian scientists. Okay, we have talked a lot about space. Of course, you want to hear about rockets, right? So I said that I was part of the team that built AstroSat, which means that I got to go to see the launch. You want to see your rocket launch? Right, so if you are sitting at home, this is what you see, right? This is a clip directly from Doordarshan. And what you would see is of course the famous countdown that you always have. So let's, okay, let's count down with this, okay? Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three. Okay. Seems, it always feels awesome when a rocket takes off, right? And now imagine instead of seeing this on TV, you, it will be so much cooler if you are there in person, correct? So of course I was very excited in 2015 when I got a chance to go to Sri Harikota in September to actually watch the rocket launch. You want to see the video I took with my phone? All right. So, this is where, again, I want you to count down with me, okay? Start. Five, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three, wait for stop. Where's the rocket? You didn't count clearly enough, I mean, where's the rocket? Nahi dikh rahe. Okay, let's see if we see it at all, okay?
what happens is that a camera can be put very close to the rocket but a rocket is basically how many of you have played with firecrackers in diwali most of you have good right a rocket is not very different from say a sutari bomb okay it just decides whether everything burns together or slightly slowly and you don't want to be sitting next to it right you light it and you run away you don't sit there and oh so the same problem is here you can put a camera very close to a rocket but all people have to be far away we were 3 kilometers away and the rocket had to rise quite a bit before we saw it above these trees there is one more thing have you heard the rocket yet you have heard people shouting and now you hear so it had almost that is how far away we were okay I am sure you have all heard that light travels faster than sound. You have probably seen it again in Diwali fireworks, where you see a rocket explode first and hear it a bit later. We were three, four kilometers away, so it took about ten seconds for that sound to reach us. And by that time, the rocket had almost disappeared in the clouds. So working on space telescopes is fun, but launches can be disappointing. Okay, keep that in mind. By the way, I was also remember I am a student from Pune. and i have been sitting there once and here once and here once as a school student and here today i am i have launched two satellites and i'm going to tell you about the third one that we are about to build so you can also be here if you want later okay so what have we done with astrosat we have done a lot of things so what do i do now is we build telescopes and basically i like toys right so i make large toys to watch things going boom okay except that my toys are now space telescopes and robotic telescopes and things going boom are stars so here's an example this is something called a gamma ray burst what you see here is a giant blue star this will be maybe 10 20 times heavier than the sun and let's see if this video plays okay so what happens is that over time at the end of its life the star actually explodes and it shoots out these massive jets okay and those jets actually rip apart the entire star inside out in what is called a supernova explosion and at the center here a black hole is born okay so astrosat has done many 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 interesting things uh, i won't go into all of them you can see them on the astrosat website but the coolest one which my group enjoys the most and actually one of my students is sitting here i'm going to embarrass her by making her stand up So Devita just finished her PhD studying these explosions with Astrosat, and over time, we have seen uh, over the last nine years we have seen seven hundred of these explosions all over the sky. Okay, so you can see a count on the left here and the dates on the right there, and you can see where these explosions are happening in the sky. They don't look like this. This is an optical camera view with the explosions plotted on top of it. We see them in X-rays and gamma rays. Okay. a star which is 10 20 30 times heavier than the sun which lives for a few million years dies in a matter of seconds and we see this bright flash in x rays and gamma rays and we have seen a lot of them with astrosat but we want to do more right astrosat was 9 years ago so if we are now going forward you will have heard of some more recent missions from isro right let's start with this what is this chandrayaan right and this is the chandrayaan lander this photo is not chandrayaan 3 this is chandrayaan 2 and what i want to talk about is not the lander which unfortunately crashed but about the orbiter which did its job extremely well and is continuing to do that now you'll say okay but chandrayaan is not studying you know it's studying the moon and this is what you would usually call a planetary science mission not an astrophysics mission okay so if i if i told you that i'm going to talk about astrophysics and space science about going to space to study space then why am i talking about this because one of the instruments on chandrayaan on the chandrayaan 2 orbiter is this little box called the xsm 
which stands for the X-ray Solar Monitor. Okay, and X-ray Solar Monitor looks at the sun continuously, sitting next to the moon, so again outside Earth's atmosphere, and it sees what the sun does in X-rays. And what it has seen, so this is a plot from last week, okay, and you can see that the sun actually emits a lot of X-rays and it suddenly becomes brighter and fainter over time. By the way, one more thing which you uh, might not know about ISRO is that a large fraction of ISRO's data is publicly available for free. So, for example, if you go to this website or if you just search for XSM online, okay, all of these data are available for download. I did not use any special login or privileges to get this plot. Okay, so anyone who wants to start studying these things can go to sites like this. The main site is called the ISRO Space Science Data Center or ISSDC. And with ISSDC, you can, anyone can create an account and download data from a large number of astrophysics missions. For other ISRO missions, there's a portal called Bhuvan, where you can actually get all Earth imaging data, Earth science data, and so on as well. What about this one? What mission is this? Does anyone know? This is not, yes, somebody there said it right. Who was that? Aditya L1. Right? So, if you want to study the sun, why not build a proper solar telescope itself? This is again the latest and greatest solar telescope in the whole world. Okay, Again built in India, Ayuka actually has a payload on this. Some of you who have come to previous lectures will have heard about this in great detail. So, I am not going to go into further details, but this is the Aditya L1 mission. And the latest astrophysics mission, so Aditya L1 by the way, yes, I almost forgot this. So, Aditya L1 sits in a point called L1, which is called the Lagrange 1 point. Okay, are they going to go in or no? Okay, so if you come to Ayuka on an open day, okay, uh, where you can actually go to that side of Ayuka, where right now you can't go because people are working, even though it's a weekend. But uh, there you will actually see something called Roche lobes, where, uh, which are shown in a nice garden. L1 is basically if, suppose the sun is here and the earth is here, okay, if I drop something from close to earth, then because of gravity, it will fall to earth. If I drop something close to the sun, it will fall to the sun. Somewhere in between, there is going to be a point where these forces balance out. Okay, and it's a bit more subtle. It's not just the gravitational force, but also the centrifugal force that has to balance out. And that point is called a Lagrange 1 point. And Aditya L1 sits there between sun and earth. And to send it there was complicated. So it was launched from earth and slowly the orbit was raised and then finally it was it this is soi sphere of influence it exited and then it went and started in what is called a halo orbit around l1 right and we said huh this is interesting we are sending a mission to space and we have space telescopes of course but we also have ground telescopes so we calculated or we well, we didn't calculate we went to a website just as you can and we said where is aditya going to be as a function of time. So this was something which was done in, uh, you can see the date here, 6th of September 2023. And Aditya was in one of these transfer orbits. And we took the Growth India Telescope. You saw this in the first animation. This is a picture inside the dome now. You can see that this is a robotic telescope because there's no comfortable furniture inside. No one will sit at the telescope. There's this rickety plastic chair. The temperature at Hanley at night time goes to minus 20 degrees. Sitting in an open dome on a plastic chair is not anybody's idea of fun. Okay, not just that, when we told the telescope company that we operate the telescope at minus 20, they were shocked. Okay, because whenever you have any gear wheels or anything, you use grease, right? Whenever you have any wheels, you use grease to make sure that it, or you add oil to make sure that there is no friction, it's well lubricated. In winter, you will have noticed that oil, even in Pune winters, oil actually becomes thick. At minus 20, grease also freezes. So even there, we have to use special lubricants to actually make sure the telescope can work. Anyway, so this is the robotic telescope. And we went and we pointed to this location in the sky. And sure enough, we saw Aditya. So this, these are all stars in the background. And this little streak that you see going through is Aditya on its way to the sun. So just for fun, we went and said hello. Of course, Aditya didn't hear it, but we saw it. Right? This is like when you're cousins are leaving after summer holidays and they are gone in a car and you are waving, they are already no longer looking back at you, right? Okay. 
The latest astrophysics mission that ISRO launched was actually a Happy New Year gift this year. This was launched on 1st of January and it's a satellite called ExpoSat, the X-ray polarization satellite. And this is the only the second telescope in the whole world that can measure something called polarization. Polarization is a word you may have heard in the context of goggles. Okay, so sunglasses are polarized or another place where you might have heard about polarization is how many of you have seen 3D films? Okay, you have to wear those glasses, right? So those glasses are also polarized glasses and uh, polarization gets a bit technical so I am not going to explain what it is but you can go read it up, right? All right, so that's all about the past and recent future and so on. So you know where I'm going with this. Of course, now we have to talk about actual future, right? So do you think India should stop building space telescopes? No. Should India build like a mediocre space telescope? Should we build an awesome space telescope? Yes. Good enough or world's best? World's best. Okay, let Okay, so in 2018, ISRO announced a call for proposals. And many different groups around the country actually proposed many different space telescope concepts. Okay, and here are some of them. And all of these are concepts which are, so there were a large number of proposals. The best few were selected by ISRO for further study and development. You have to build a proof of concept, you have to develop laboratory models and so on. And these three, out of these three, if you have not guessed, there is a, one of them is sitting on my back. So it should be quite obvious which one I'm going to talk about, which is, Daksha, okay? So, Daksha is a space telescope that we want to build, which will monitor the heavens for high energy transients, okay? So, this satellite sitting out there in space will actually look out in the entire sky for things that are exploding, right? Toys to watch things go boom, but these toys actually give us a huge understanding of the universe and the things going boom are things which are even called mini big bangs. Okay, so these explosions that we talked about, these gamma ray bursts, in a matter of a few seconds, they emit more energy than the sun will emit in its entire 10 billion year lifetime. Okay, that is how powerful they are. Okay, and Daksha is going to use not one but two satellites because when you are orbiting around Earth in what is called a low Earth orbit, the earth itself blocks about one third of the sky. So how do you see something that is happening on that side? Right? Imagine for example, you were um, playing with your friends and you are supposed to look out for people coming in. You stand on one side of this auditorium. If someone comes from that side, you won't be able to see it. Right? So you will want someone standing on the opposite side of the building as well. So we want the same thing. The building is replaced by earth and we are replaced by satellites. You could go there, you wouldn't see X-rays and it kind of becomes hard to breathe in outer space. So satellites are better. Okay. What we want to do, my favorite topic of study is we want to study, remember we talked about neutron stars and we talked about the universe being crazy. What's happening here is two neutron stars are orbiting each other and they actually collide and they explode. And we have seen explosions like these before. These are called binary neutron star mergers. Okay, so this object which is heavier than the sun, about the size of Pune, now imagine two of them that are going around and about to collide, movements before collision, they spin around each other so fast that that spinning is faster than the spinning of, let's say, a Formula 1 car wheel. Okay, except that we are not talking about a tiny wheel, we are talking about something that's heavier than the sun. Now, all of this is very important because this is where a lot of interesting things in the universe actually happen, okay? For example, so first thing is that these are extremely rare, okay? Uh, astronomers all around the world have been trying very, very hard to find it, including our group, including various colleagues at Ayuka. And in all the years of searching, we have been searching for decades and we have seen exactly one event, just one, okay? So we have to really, really be alert we have to keep looking out. We don't want to have a scenario where, for example, if you are sitting and watching a cricket match, it's very boring. You get up and say, I'll go to the kitchen, drink water, and just then somebody hits a six, right? All of your effort is wasted because that was the one ball in which you were not in front of the TV. But finally, you didn't see the action, right? So we don't want that scenario. That is where we want to build the... Now this 
न्यूट्रॉन स्टार मर्जर्स आर वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग ओके फॉर एग्जाम्पल हैव यू हर्ड ऑफ समथिंग कॉल्ड ग्रेविटेशनल वेव्स और द लाइगो इंडिया प्रोजेक्ट राइट सो दीज न्यूट्रॉन स्टार मर्जर्स ऑल्सो एमेट ग्रेविटेशनल वेव्स एंड विल स्टडी दम विद लाइगो इंडिया एंड विद अदर थिंग्स बट दे आर ऑल्सो द प्लेसेस वेर अ लॉट ऑफ इंटरेस्टिंग एलिमेंट्स ऑन द अर्थ आर फॉर्म ओके नॉट जस्ट ऑन अर्थ एलिमेंट्स इन द एंटायर यूनिवर्स आर बींग फॉर्म सो वॉट्स युअर फेवरेट एलिमेंट Do you know elements? Do you have a favorite? Which one? Hydrogen. Okay, you can all have hydrogen. What else? Okay, carbon. You can have carbon. Sure. Okay, don't have uranium. It will kill you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Someone said oxygen. My personal favorite is oxygen. If you want to take away one element from me, then don't take away oxygen. Okay. but it turns out a lot of people also like this particular element what is this right so how much gold is there on earth does anyone know okay so if you take all of earth okay and you measure all the gold that we think exists on earth including the ones in safe deposit lockers of all the rich guys then it adds up to about 0.0000000000000004 times the mass of the earth okay now where was this gold formed so when the universe was born it was born mainly with hydrogen little bit of helium and that's about it some small traces of lithium beryllium nothing beyond that there was no carbon even life couldn't have been formed there all the carbon nitrogen oxygen that makes up all of organic chemistry and us was actually manufactured by the universe inside of a star okay so we are all made of stardust okay that star at the end of its life exploded it spread around all of those elements and then the next generation of stars were born from that including the sun and the earth was also formed from that but that is still not quite a complete story because what happens is that in the centers of stars you can only build elements up to iron along the periodic table you can't make gold you can't make silver you can't make platinum you can't make uranium the only way we need know to make all of these is something called r process nucleosynthesis those of you who go on to study physics later will hear more about that but essentially you have to have a place where which, which has a large number of neutrons right what stars did we see colliding neutron stars so largest number of neutrons that you can have right in an atom of uranium you have something like 120 140 or so 140 i think neutrons in a neutron star you have billion 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 neutrons more fun numbers to deal with right so when two neutron star collide you make a large amount of gold can you guess as compared to the amount of gold on earth how much will it make will it make a similar amount or larger so maybe uh, maybe i can delete say these zeros and say 0.000004 times mass of earth delete a lot more zeros even that doesn't help here is how much gold would actually be created in such a event okay keep counting keep counting okay so the total gold made there is enough to make 100 to 200 entire earths of pure gold right this is not 200 times the amount of gold found on earth you remove everything else from earth replace it with pure gold boring place to live in by the way if there is so much gold nobody values it but if you still do that and do it 100 more times then that's how much gold is created in one single merger right and we want to study and understand things like these and in order to do that a space telescope like daksha is needed it's a very rare event so you need a very special space telescope very sensitive and daksha is absolutely designed to study such binary neutron star mergers okay and that's not the only thing that we will study what is this and the sun also does a lot of funny and weird things okay so you see what just happened here a solar flare so you have solar flares and you have prominences and they create a large number of x rays okay and daksha will be the best x ray monitor that will ever have been made to look at the sun Aditya L1 I said is a great solar telescope Aditya does a lot of thing there is one small instrument on Aditya called uh, Helios which looks for x rays in the sun daksha will be something like 60 times more sensitive than Helios for x ray studies of the sun 
not just the sun and space, Daksha can also actually help us study things back on earth. Okay, so when you have clouds, you have lightning. Now some type of lightning, it turns out can actually emit X-rays and gamma rays. Okay, and they go up. Now these clouds are high in the atmosphere, that X-rays coming down will actually get absorbed, just as all other X-rays. But if they are going up, then you can actually have space telescopes study them and that helps us better understand weather, better understand thunderstorms, better understand our atmosphere. So these terrestrial gamma ray flashes also, Daksha will be the best observatory ever built in the whole world to be able to study things like this. Okay, so here are the current telescopes that detect these explosions in space. Okay, so this is a NASA telescope called Fermi, joint NASA ESA project, SWIFT is another NASA project. And you can see that they are all quite growing old, okay. So in human ages, they are younger than some of you, older than some of you. But in spacecraft ages, they are usually designed to last for like five, six years. After that, their quality starts going down. Integral is so old that in a few more months, they are going to shut it down. These two have discovered the largest number of GRVs ever. And Astrosat will be third, by the way, with the 700 GRVs that we have. But all of these are growing old. And Daksha will, so Astrosat detected 700 GRBs in nine years, 700 of these gamma ray burst explosions. Daksha will detect them in just over a year. That is how much more sensitive Daksha will be. Okay, so this, forget the details of the plot, but how big the bar is, is how good the satellite is. Okay, so there is, this is Swift and Fermi. This one is a French Chinese mission. This one is a European mission. And you can see that India will be leading the way all the way through. The remote suddenly decides whether it wants to work or not, okay? Anyway, so I think we should end here. We are right at the end of our time, leaving a few minutes for us for questions. Thank you all. Very lovely talk and a uh, lot of things to think about. I'm sure you might have some curious questions as well for uh, about the things that were covered here by Professor Bhalera. So if you have any question, uh, please raise your hands. We will come to you with the mic and we can take a few questions here. It's your chance to interact with a practicing scientist. Don't miss it. Let's start with the young boy there. You can take the mic. Uh, 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 as we know that black hole absorbs uh, everything, even as the light. So, uh, in a black hole outer uh, space, how we can find it? That's a very good question, right? So, black holes absorb everything that's close to them. That's an important point. Okay, for example, if you have a vacuum cleaner at home, it sucks in everything. But if I switch on a vacuum cleaner in one corner of the room, the opposite wall doesn't fall down and go into it, right? So black holes similarly have very strong gravity if you are very close to them. If you take the sun and you replace it with a black hole of the same mass, then earth will not get sucked in. Actually nothing will change on earth except that we won't have daylight anymore. Okay, the earth's orbit will continue to remain the same. Now the question though is that black holes do not emit any light, so how do we study them? And the answer is that it is not about studying things inside the black hole, but studying things close to a black hole. Okay, so let me go and play this movie again. Okay, so once the light actually enters a black hole or once matter enters a black hole, it cannot emit any light. But as it is falling into the black hole, it is kicking and crying and screaming and that you can hear. Not literally. But as this stuff is falling into the black hole, if I drop something from here, first it moves slowly and then it starts accelerating, right? Under gravity, it starts moving faster and faster. In this thing, disk, um, the stuff, the gas and dust and so on, which is falling in, moves extremely fast, okay? It moves at something like 10% or 20% the speed of light, okay? It will move at 30,000 kilometers per second. And then, imagine you have cars driving on Pune roads at 30,000 kilometers per second. What will happen? Accidents. So here also stuff collides into each other. And when these streams of gas collide into each other outside the black hole, they heat up. Okay, and that heat is what causes the emission of X-rays. Once those things fall into the black hole, they can no longer emit light, which is exactly what was seen by IXAE. 
Okay, so if you look at this, this is exactly what happened. As that material is going closer and closer to the black hole, it is heating up more and more and it would continue heating up except that it fell in. So we can no longer see any light coming from that. Um, good morning, sir. Uh, so basically you told about all the awesome satellites and like how magnificent they are and how much information they are telling us beyond the earth, right? So if, act if we humans actually want to get even beyond that, like outside of a universe or something like that, we need something which is faster than light and we can actually get those satellites over there so that we can actually get the info closely, right? So uh, is there anything like, is there any how we can get something faster than light? And are there any space, space scientists or space programs that are actually working to get that? So that's a very interesting question, right? And that's something that is very fascinating from a perspective of imagination or from science fiction. And it is always this imagination and curiosity that drives progress. Okay, so you and everyone else here, make sure that you keep that curiosity alive. If, if everyone simply studies theory of relativity and says we can't go faster than light, that's enough. Then we are not going to make any more progress. Just as if Einstein said Newton's laws are enough, we would not have home delivery today. Right? That does not mean, of course, that you can, it's not a rule that you can break. Teacher says don't talk in class, you started talking rule broken. Rules of the universe are a bit more strict than that, okay? So you have to respect them, but you can still do more research and figure out if there's a way to circumvent them. There are concepts like wormholes, which will allow us to go from one part of the universe to another without actually breaking the light speed barrier. There are also concepts like tachyons about particles that should move faster than the speed of light. These are all, however, still in the realm of theory, in the realm of speculation. We have not seen or detected anything like that yet. Uh, these are topics that are under investigation. There are people thinking about it. But unfortunately, as of right now, we don't have any means to do that. That said, a lot of the space technology that we have today was unimaginable when, for example, your teachers were your age. Okay, at that point, if, you, if they had heard this lecture at that point in time, they would have thought that all of this is black magic. Okay, so by the time you are your teacher's age, we don't know what technology we'll have developed by then. And at that point, some of you hopefully will be actually working on developing things like this. So as of right now, we don't have anything that allows us to travel faster than light or to jump across large distances in space. But there are people who are thinking about it and who knows, maybe in the future it might be possible. It might turn out that it is not possible at all. We don't know. Yes, so my doubt is about uh, the black holes. So the black holes, do they have a finite lifespan? And if they do, what happens to the matter they suck in? Okay, so um, that's an interesting question. Uh, large black holes will have a very, very long lifetime. Okay, so typically when we talk about black holes, we think of them as big and scary things. But that is not necessarily a physics rule that can, that forces that, okay? For, from a theoretical perspective, nothing prevents me from say, taking this and crushing it into a black hole, okay? And the black hole of this size will be a million times smaller than an atom. Okay, if I take a black hole that is the size of an atom, by the way, this is interesting. If I take a black hole whose size is as much as a hydrogen atom, it will weigh as much as an asteroid. That is how dense these black holes can be. And these extremely tiny black holes, uh, by the way, there's another student here, Priyanka, who has worked on those ultra tiny black holes. Okay, she is a student at Ayuka. These extremely tiny black holes can actually get destroyed by some phenomenon called Hawking radiation. Okay, but even then, even for this atom sized black hole to die, it will take more than the age of the universe. Okay. What happens to the matter, we don't fully know. As far as we understand that matter is lost and destroyed when it forms into a black hole, it gets converted. Einstein has this concept of mass and energy being interchangeable, so it gets converted into mass. And then as the black hole evaporates and dies, it gets emitted as some complex form of radiation. That is, that is our current best understanding. Uh, 
Uh, what uh, happens? Sorry, there is a question at the front, so let me answer that, though it was out of turn. Uh, Bermuda Triangle is an uh, ancient um, uh, fable. Okay. Bermuda Triangle is a part of the ocean where the weather is always foggy. And as a result, 100 years ago when ships had really bad navigation, they would actually not be able to navigate there and would frequently crash on rocks and sink. Now with modern technology, there is no risk of traveling through the Bermuda Triangle anymore. So it is just an old uh, story that has been left over. It has nothing to do with black holes and it is basically it's like don't go into the jungle, animals will eat you. So don't go into the Bermuda Triangles, rocks will sink you. If you go in the jungle and know where all the animals are, you are safe. If you go into Bermuda Triangle and know where all the rocks are, you are safe. In space also we navigate without bumping into things usually. Space is far more empty than we imagine. There was a question at the back somewhere, no? Sorry. Uh, what happens to space-time when cosmic objects collide? What happens to space-time when cosmic objects collide? Space-time gets wrinkled. That is what happens. Okay, so uh, space-time is this concept by Einstein which says that space and time, we think of space as three dimensions, forward, left, right and up, down. And then there is time which as far as we are concerned only goes forward. You want to sleep more on a Saturday morning but time keeps going forward. Right, so you have to wake up. So Einstein and theory of relativity actually showed that these can get mixed up in a concept called space-time. And uh, space-time is affected by the presence of mass. Okay, so when someone like you is sitting there, you are distorting space-time around you. Someone fat like me is standing on stage, I am distorting space-time a bit more. But not quite as much as the earth under us. Okay, it is distorting space-time a lot. So when I walk around on stage, this distortion of space-time is moving with me, right? I was standing there five seconds ago, space-time there was distorted, now it is not, I am further away. And this distortion has to move with me, and this movement actually creates ripples that flow out in space-time, and that is what gravitational waves are. I am sure there will be a separate lecture that has been organized on gravitational waves, if not, catch him later and ask him to do one, right? Because Ayuka is leading the LIGO India science aspects, so you should have lectures on that here. So when objects collide, they actually, these distortions in space-time as the collision is happening, send, spread out through the universe as ripples, which are called gravitational waves. They were first detected in 2015, um, just before AstroSat was launched, incidentally, a week before AstroSat was launched, and that discovery won a Nobel Prize in 2016. So my doubt is actually just we learned about the stars and all. So what is dark matter actually? like? That's a very good question. In fact, that question is so good that nobody knows the answer. Okay? Uh, it's, it's quite interesting, right? Uh, and there are two interesting parts to it. Okay? The first interesting part is that uh, the universe has a lot of mysteries that we don't understand. And the second interesting part is very interesting in a different way. That here I am standing as a scientist in front of you. And you expect me to be smart and answer all questions about black holes. And then I'm telling you I don't know. And it's okay to say I don't know. Okay? And that is very, very important. There are things out there that we do not know. There are things out there that are still mysteries to us. There are things that humankind as a whole might know, but I might not know. And there's nothing wrong in that. Okay? So dark matter is something that is present in the universe. We know it is there because we can feel its gravity. We can see the effects of it gra its gravity. But then you say, okay, so somewhere there, there is some massive object. And we look at all types of massive objects that we know. We look at stars, we look at planets, galaxies, dust, gas, black holes, everything. And we look for all of them and they are not present there. Okay, so there is matter, but it is not emitting light. As far as we know, it's not sucking up light like black holes either. And it's just there. We can see the gravity, but we can't find it. It's extremely annoying, very frustrating. So a lot of people are working hard to actually try to find that dark matter, um, including the work on these very tiny black holes, whether they could be dark matter, and we just don't know. And there is five to six times more dark matter in the universe than there is matter. Okay, so all the stuff around us, all the gold and oxygen and carbon we talked about, all these elements make up only one-sixth as much matter as dark matter. There's a question here. Okay. 
sir how sir, can there is we a question find... at the back and then one here yes go on go on sir how can we find the mass of objects in space how do we find the mass of objects in space that's a very interesting point so what happens is that we try to measure that mass based on their gravitational effect okay there's a girl behind who has a question sorry so uh, yeah so what happens is uh, if i just see something i can't guess their mass okay sometimes you can right if you see a human if you know my weight and if you see someone standing next to me who looks about the same size you will guess their weight but if suddenly there is a small dog that you see or a giant elephant that you see you can't guess its mass so it's very difficult the way we measure the mass is by its effect gravitational effect on things around it okay so how fast the earth goes around the sun is decided by so if i have you all heard of centrifugal force yes yes okay so the reason earth goes around the sun in a nice circular orbit or nearly circular orbit is that the gravitational force of the sun is equal to the centrifugal force of earth going around okay and the gravitational force depends on the mass of the sun the centrifugal force does not okay so we use this idea of balancing these two things out and we measure how fast objects are moving around something else and that is how we measure the mass so for example i said at the start that our milky way has by universal standards a very wimpy supermassive black hole which is only 4 million times heavier than the sun how do we know that because scientists have actually used very powerful telescopes to see stars that are going around that black hole and measuring how fast those stars move they calculated the mass of that black hole yes is time travel really a thing because in the movie it is shown that when he leaves the earth his daughter is very young and when he reaches the black yes. hole spends time so there are a lot of movies about time travel okay so i'll skip the description um, okay since you talked about interstellar okay interstellar is about as logical as a bollywood movie okay the movie begins with a problem for those of you who have watched it the movie begins with a problem where the hero is crying because the last crop of i kid you not bhindi is dying okay so he is sad that this is going to be the last bhindi ever grown on earth and earth is dying right this is scene number 1 then for 95% of the movie they figure out how to go to space and they learn how black holes work okay spoiler alert black holes don't work like that then last scene everyone is living happily ever after how does this make sense right earth pe bhindi nahi tha here's how black holes work yay makes absolutely no sense to me but anyway the black holes are cool okay then coming to your question he also goes inside a black hole finds libraries and some of apparently explains time travel that also is wrong but the question is interesting is time travel possible as far as we know it is not okay and there have been a lot of interesting experiments and uh, ideas about it for example uh, how many of you have heard of stephen hawking okay so stephen hawking once held a time travel party okay and then he sent out invitations to the party the day after the party okay and he said that if time travel is ever possible in the future then time traveler should come to my party yesterday to prove that it is possible but nobody came which means it's not possible also from our understanding of laws of physics in particular entropy we don't think time travel in that sense is possible there is time travel in a limited sense of the term which is that if you take two different paths in space time to come to the same point then you might age differently also a concept used in interstellar and for a change used correctly which is that if you go very close to a black hole time appears to travel slower for you as compared to something which is further away that effect is real but it is not time travel in the sense that you are asking that you can't go back and become younger you can grow older faster or slower than others so in that sense instead of traveling in time you are adjusting the rate of flow of time that is possible in relativity so listening to you i came i just thought of this question can you please say something about sunita williams written <laughs> um yes so sunita williams right now is in space and she is stuck in space okay but uh, i will summarize that with a very awesome cartoon that i saw okay in in one of my favorite comic strips called xkcd uh, where the cartoon simply say, showed a sketch of a person no name used but uh, it was implied that it's sunita williams looking out of the space station and earth at earth and she is saying that until people manage to launch another 
rocket with people on it, 7 billion people are stuck on earth. Right? It's just a matter of perspective. Sunita Williams was sent somewhere for her work as a part of her job in space. That's her job. She's an astronaut. right? Your parents get up in the morning and go to office. She got up one morning and went to space. That was her job, her office. And she missed the evening bus to come back home. Okay. The consequence is that the next bus will come six months down the line. But the space station is designed to handle these contingencies. Okay. It is annoying that I was planning to go today evening, now I have to go six months later. It's annoying, but it is not a risk in the sense that she is not going to starve there, they are not going to have to start eating each other or something. She's fine. Right? It is, however, an interesting um, observation on how difficult space travel still is. Right? We take it for granted that huh, astronauts are going to why can't India send something? No, Gaganyan is still not ready. Right? So, going to space is extremely harsh. Space environment will kill you the moment it gets a chance. There is no air to begin with. Right? Um, things are moving. The space station, in, in space movies you see things, things going like this slowly, right? Zero G. Everything around in low earth orbit is moving at 8 kilometers per second. Okay? 8 kilometers per second. So, if you want to go from here to Mumbai, you will go there in less time than it takes me to finish this entire sentence. That's how fast things move. Okay? So, if you fall behind, you are in problem. If something comes and hits you, a small ball bearing hitting, uh, coming at 8 kilometers per second will pass through this entire auditorium and leave two small holes as a cartoon style. Uh, entry hole and the exit hole. That's how much energy these things pack. Okay, so space is harsh and as humanity we have still not mastered space flight or space as a whole to that extent. So these are the early days of space exploration. There are a few hundred startups in India right now doing space exploration for example. And all of these companies will develop and all of you youngsters, if you want to get into science, if you want to get into research, then both astrophysics on one hand and space science on the other hand are fantastic fields to build careers in. Okay. I think that was probably a good point to close. Right? Uh, last okay. question. From yeah. Uh, sir, you just said that we can't do time travel by the laws of physics. But is it possible in future if we can do time travel with the help of light? So the same point, right? Uh, the laws of physics as we understand them now don't allow time travel. In the context that we know, these laws are not likely to change. But for a few hundred years, we did not know that time and space can actually mix up and form space time either. So somebody going forward may discover it or they might discover that it is always going to remain impossible. We don't know. right? You or someone else here might be the person to make that discovery. We don't know. So these are interesting questions. Keep asking. Thank you for your questions. And uh, it's, it's been a very interesting uh, dialogue. And uh, Professor uh, Bhalero has been also stressing that you should base things on more on reality rather than fantasies. Although fantasy is good to have as a, as a, as a thing to keep your excitement alive, uh, base things on reality. And although we call it astrophysics, space science, and everything, you'll realize that the basic of it is physics, which you learn in school, right? And the language of that is mathematics. So I think it's it's a you know good point where we can mention uh, these things that, and, and maybe also I'll ask a small question uh, for uh, Varun that, you know, how did you go through your career? What are the particular things that you are interested in, which led to your really being here, making real things, not time travel machines, which are on books. In books. Okay, so um, if you, how many of you like science? Not as a school subject necessarily, but science. Science is interesting. How many of you find this stuff interesting for everyone? Everyone, right? So whether you want to be a scientist or not, there is something called scientific temper. There is a way of thinking like a scientist. Incidentally, that is also one of your duties as defined by the Constitution of India. Okay. The constitution says that every Indian must have scientific temper. Now, the thing about scientific temper is it means that you have to rigorously test everything and don't believe it blindly. So, I will give you a homework problem. Now, you are like, yeah, Saturday ko aage te, homework bhi de rahe. Okay? Homework, okay, we will transfer it to your parents. Ask your parents to look up the copy of the constitution on the government's website and in that see if it really asks you to have scientific temper. Okay? 
So what you need to become a scientist is basically you need curiosity. That's the most important thing. Okay. When you see something new, ask why it works that way or why it doesn't work that way. You actually try to answer those questions. You should drive your teachers crazy by asking questions, but sensible questions, right? Don't ask them suddenly, why, can, why can't I have ice cream now? No, that is, that is not helping you become a scientist, right? But why does this work this way? Why does this not work? Okay. And you then try finding answers to those questions. Now, um, one thing which is different today from when I was sitting there is that you have far easier access to the internet. And unfortunately, a lot of uh, online channels have more garbage than useful material. Okay. For example, if you look up, um, if you have read about astro or seen things about astrophysics, then you'll think that wormholes and time travel is what all astronomers are always thinking about. Okay. But it's easy to see that is not true because if you have seen your parents watch a Hindi or a Marathi serial at home, then clearly your family drama is nowhere as close to what happens in those serials, right? Or how many of you have older brothers or sisters who are maybe in college? Okay, or maybe neighborhood friends, ask them if college life is what it looks like in Bollywood movies. It isn't. So the same way, astronomers don't spend all of their time thinking about black holes or wormholes the way um, people on in movies and so on seem to. So find places where you'll get authentic information. Ayuka's Saipop channel are a fantastic place. Uh, and they, ha they also have a curated list of other channels uh, which are where you'll find legitimate material. So keep Stay curious, keep asking more questions. In terms of formal education, physics and maths, as Samir pointed out, is extremely important. And uh, over time, as you study it more, uh, you can then, if you decide to specialize, you can go for a BSc uh, or an undergraduate degree in physics, BSc, BTech. You could also go into engineering if you want to go towards space science and build rockets and satellites. Okay. And then after that, typically you go and do your PhD. Now, in my own case, I did not know 20 years ago what I will be doing today. Okay, time travel forwards is possible, but only at one second per second. So, 20 years ago, I could not jump forward and see what happens today. So, I took things which were interesting and kept pursuing them further. Keep looking out for opportunities. Opportunities are hard to find, they are rare. So, the moment you see an opportunity, jump on it. And then, as you find things that are more interesting, as you discover what you like, start talking to people who work in those fields. So one step which you have already taken is coming here to listen to a lecture about space and astrophysics. right? So start talking to people to understand what their field and what their careers are actually like. And then on the basis of that is where you will get guidance about how to proceed. Thank you. Lovely words of advice. And so let's thank uh, Dr. Bhaler again for uh, giving us this beautiful lecture with all these lovely images. Thank you. So much information. Thank you so much again.